Hello, everyone, and welcome to Trek Prime, episode 10. This is our 10th episode. I, I can't believe it. And I guess we have a 10th episode special here. We've got a special guest star, Captain Stuart Foley from Trek Yards. Yes, well, thank you guys for having me. Um, sorry, yeah. Samuel couldn't make it, but he's on UK time. And that's... Yeah, and shout out to you, Samuel Cocklings. I, we were going to have you on. Eventually, if we can work out the schedule, I promise. And I don't break my promises. So we'll have you on here. And uh, tonight, the three of us are going to be discussing, because on Trek Prime, Jeff and I usually trade off picking a subject each week. And this week, I have the subject. And as I was just telling you, both of you, that uh, I was watching a video by a friend of mine named Steve Shives. And he does a lot of different videos about different subjects. But he's a major... Uh, Star Trek fan, and I like the way he kind of links things up. You know, everybody has a different approach, but he was talking about Star Trek Voyager and how he wasn't really crazy about it, but one of his reasons was because of there was too much techno babble to explain everything, and he saw that, in his case, as an example of bad writing. Now, I got to think of going back to TOS, which that's one of the reasons why we have you here, Stuart, because you're Mr. TOS. So um, I thought that you would be really good to discuss that end of it. And we can kind of all join in from different places. And, you know, yeah. Stuart, you, you've been into Star Trek anyway, all of it. So here's the thing. Um, if we go back to TOS, which was really the start of Star Trek, Enterprise was the start of it in the history. But, mm -hmm. but TOS was really the first one they did. It was the, it was the, it's like the classic Coke. It's the real thing, Star Trek. Mm -hmm. So that's where it yeah. started. And from in the 60s. So we want to go and see how Technobabble, as they call it now, goes from the 1960s up to, uh, I guess we're talking about Star Trek Prime here, Enterprise, I guess. You know, how Technobabble goes from one series to the other. So, uh, um, you know, uh, Stuart, I wanted to ask you, uh, how do you feel... Uh, Techno babble, did it detract or help in TOS? And wasn't all that present, do you think? Uh, well, I don't, I can't really think of any specific ones from TOS. TOS wasn't as advanced as Star Trek is now, so the techno babble, I think, was very dialed back. <laughs> um, right. Back then. It, so. it, running gag coming up here, that was a circuit generation. <laughs> yes, close the circuit. Right, exactly. We're not even in gag now, Stuart. Okay. So, um, right, that was the everything was a circuit in those days. It, it was there wasn't all these words like you said, Stuart. For, um, the, but they did eventually start using terms like matter, antimatter, didn't they? At some point. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, I just looked up some actually. There's uh, from that which survives. Spock says computer readout and the computer's comparison analysis complete. Transporter factor M7 reassembled out phase 0. 0.0009. So okay, that's some, that's some yeah. technical right there, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So I don't think it detracts from the show. I think it actually is a big help yeah. um, because it's supposed to be more advanced. You know, they're in space, exactly. So uh, it adds to that realism. And I don't, I don't have any problem with techno babble, to be honest. Well, that's actually a good place to start. Um, Jeff, we'll go to you. You know, I think when I when I watch uh, the TOS, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the series back then, I think it was really uh, Spock that kind of introduced, you know, with his dialogue, a lot of the techno babble that was kept, you know, as the show went on. He would always come up with the, the phrases and the, you know, the descriptions of what they were right. and stuff, and then that, all of a sudden you could see how that kind of blossomed into more. Uh, well, they would utilize some of the phrases and they would make techno babble out of it later on and by season three it became you know pretty, pretty but nice. he was a science officer on the ship yeah. you know and and the executive officer but as a science officer i mean he was really you know the one who would translate this into some kind of usable mm. language you know e even if it meant the c word you know if he had to just insert whatever random circuit this circuit that but <laughs> Like I said, <laughs> okay, I don't know if he was a joke here too much, but you know, um, you were right, Stuart. You're looking that up was good because, like I said, I don't. Would you say that Stuart in, in TOS that the techno babble wasn't really refined into something 
in a coherent universe. They were just kind of making up stuff that seemed to work. Well, yes and no. I mean, they were still using uh, scientific realism. Right, yeah. And More things applicable to the 60s, you think? Or at least trying to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the thing is, not a lot of people were well-versed in that back then. Exactly. In today's modern age, with our interconnectivity, everybody knows these key words and this, this science you know, lingo. So it's just evolved. I mean, that's all there is to it. I mean, the 60s, it was, if you watch TOS, you know, the techno babble is way more um, caveman like, I guess, because you can really. Oh, nice and bear skins. Yeah, ex exactly. <laughs> there you go. Because that, that was what that was Bob would say. I'm trying to make a numeric ma memory circuit um, using stone knives and bear skins. So that's yes. basically what it comes down to. Well, numeric like memory circuit, okay? So there's something, <laughs> you know? So I guess it did come from Spock, Jeff. You're right. He, he was the source of a lot of this techno dialogue. And like I said, it was inventing a world because we didn't have a Star Trek before that. So it was inventing a whole world. Right. Yeah. You're right, Stuart. So, mm -hmm. okay. So now we get into the movie era, which is interesting because I, I've reviewed a lot of the movies. I mean, I'm sure both of you have seen the um, SNL skit with Shatner, where <laughs> the, the, the fans yeah. are saying, you pay more attention to the movies. Like, one time the movies were like, nah, they're not really quite Star Trek. There's some, you know, I don't know, I, people used to think that when I knew them. I, I don't know why I thought they were. But, you know, you get into some interesting dialogue in that, because movies are always very theatrical and they focus on plot and all that. But in the first motion picture, mm. Jeff and I talked about in our um, podcast about circuits, um, they were getting into screens, okay? And it, was, it wasn't really techno babble, but they were substituting it kind of for shields. Stuart, uh, do you have any idea what these screens were? Were they a separate thing from shields or were they... Because we were really in oh. trouble figuring this out. Deflector screens, yes. Turn the you know, screens active and all that, yeah. Um, no, I think I think that was just the term for shield back then, and that eventually did turn into shielding. I mean... So they were into the screens at that point as a term. Interesting. Yeah, I'm wondering about the... I'm trying to think back to TOS and what they actually used. Didn't they use shields in TOS most of the time? If they were referring... Was it screens? I, I think so, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, deflector screens, I think, are supposed to be different than shielding, but I'm not 100% sure on that. I'd have to look it up. And, uh, it's bad somebody didn't really define what the difference was because they would just say screens or shields here and there like it was a substitution word. I don't know. Yeah. It just yeah, it exactly. didn't really connect. Yeah. But that was the thing in the movies. Do either of you remember any major techno babble innovations that came? I got one maybe. Mm -hmm. Transwarp drive. We, I think, didn't we hear that in Star Trek 3 for the first time? Yeah, yeah, the transwarp drive, yeah. Now, I, I was looking the other day. I, I don't know where it was. They were talking about how they changed the warp scale mm -hmm. at some point between the movies and the next generation. Um, yeah. Would you think the transwarp was a messy place in there, that transwarp could mean different things to either scale uh, or... Well, we've done a video on that. There's a whole video we did. Right, yeah, that's, that's where it was. It was, it was Trek Yards. Um, but that, that was just on transwarp. But there is two scales: just the TOS scale and the next generation scale. <laughs> a lot of people have speculated or theorized that the transwarp experiment ushered in the new warp scale for TOS. Right? Yeah, because they were saying that the Excelsior transwarp didn't actually fail at all; that it was successful, and they just changed the warp scale. But, but it did. It's not the, the transwarp didn't affect the warp scale. The transwarp actually program failed. Okay, okay. so we can confirm that. That's good. Yeah, so, in one of the episodes, Data says there hasn't been a ship-wide or a whatever failure on a starship for 97 years or something. But there, was there was directly to the transwarp experiment on the Excelsior. But there are some strange things about transwarp. It seems to be a catch-all at times because the Borg have a transwarp system. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, would transwarp be a term that would apply to any warp drive outside the conventional uh, system? Something mm -hmm. that would... Not necessarily. I mean, we, again, our video, we kind of start off by saying there are other versions of transwarp with the transwarp corridors and stuff that the Borg use, but this is, we're going to focus specifically on the Federation's attempt at transwarp. And right. their version of it. So, um, so it is kind of a catch-all, I guess. The transwarp came into the movies. That was a term that came in the movies and then carried over into the series. 
Yeah. Okay, so is there any other terms you can think of the movies introduced as far as a techno babble uh, mm. addition to the Star Trek universe? The movies. Um, motion picture through six. Yeah, I know. I'm just trying to. I, I, I remember in Star Trek six where they're altering the torpedo. You know, alter circuit A. <laughs> oh, the circuit. Down the circuit. <laughs> there you go. Oh. So they're still in that circuit thing. Yeah. Well, you know, hey, we, we talked about, Jeff and I talked about how that tended to be a Gene Roddenberry thing. Maybe that yeah. was something he liked to put in there. And that, um, you know, he was alive when that movie was made. So maybe he felt he had time for one last circuit reference. I don't know. But it was there. So you're right. The alter circuit A. So they're still into that circuit stuff. So, yeah. um, okay. We get to next generation. They pretty much write the vocabulary the start. Analog, don't they? Mm. Yes. Reverse the polarity of the annular confinement. Confine there we go. There's that Jordy dialogue we have right there. And the one the good thing about next generation. Field. Yeah. They, they actually put out these tech manuals that try to explain everything. So there was an actual world you could get into where it wasn't just random advanced words were strung in there because it sounded good. It was actually a whole language. They had um, phase inducers and, and, and plasma vents and, and um, Heisenberg compensators and, yeah. and, and, you know, and then you, and Heisenberg compensators, they were actually named after somebody very important in real science. So there was all of these, and Dyson spheres. There were all these real science references. They expanded way out. So, it made the next generation with techno babble. It kind of made the Star Trek universe very believable in a way, didn't it? Because it linked it with kind of real science. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's one of the things Star Trek has always done is incorporated real science and upcoming scientific theories into the shows, uh, and it's 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 pulling the lingo from those you know discoveries and things into modern culture. So, and a lot of the techno babble is made up, but um, right, they just you can tell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can tell a lot of it is kind of scientifically based, and they try to kind of follow it. Um, but yeah, there's the odd thing with the field flux capacitor. You know, flux capacitor sounds cool, but that does time travel. So Back to the future. Put field in front of it. Yeah, exactly. Right, it's, it's, it's a dog brown um, thing. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I actually enjoy the techno babble. I mean, I would hate to memorize the lines. Don't get me wrong. Uh, yeah, but I've, I've heard people talk about having to remember these Heisenberg compensators and all that stuff. You were just talking about even I can't remember sometimes. But yeah, exactly. it, 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 it did look like, oh, these people are the real deal, aren't they? They know their stuff. It just seemed like that looking at it. Well, in my case, from a, a kid's point of view, and by the way, Stuart, just to give you, I mean, Jeff knows this, but some context. I was watching some TOS at about six and seven. So that's where I started from. Then I got into the next generation, but I still started out with a little TOS. So cool. that's kind of my context, you know? So I, I do look at it yeah. like, um, I get I a little bit. Like, original crew didn't do a lot of that. Yeah. I mean, but next generation I started right out with, but I, I had a little TOS still from syndication. So it was there. It wasn't like, you know, but so that there's still that context, but, uh, you know, you know, it's funny when I get to the next series, you know, D space nine, I don't mm. really remember about much techno babble in that. It seemed to follow some next generation principles, but more like this and that is broken. How do you fix this thing? It, it, it always seemed like yeah. something was breaking down or they needed to repair it. So you always heard things in the context of it being repaired. And you hear techno babble. We we have to do this to make that. I, I don't even remember what they said, but the, it would be O'Brien trying to get something not to spark or blow up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the way Brian O'Brien described it, he he was kind of the everyman, so he didn't really go he to didn't the techno babble match. He went straight to the point. <laughs> right. <laughs> he needed to do this or whatever. Yeah. He wasn't like Jordy who had to define everything, you know, or Spock. Exactly. So, um, Jeff, do you remember anything in D Space Nine that was really techno babble ish that really stood out? I don't know. I when I, I kind of think back to to the series, and it seems to me like they they wanted to kind of use a little more slang in, a lot in the show, right? To make it feel more like you know real people talking, you know, not yeah. so much like computers talking to computers, but you know, give it a more feel of humanity. To exactly, it. and. 
I think, Stuart, you're right about that. Deep Space Nine was just philosophically a whole different way of doing Star Trek, trying to reach people more. And yeah. like O'Brien being every man. So that, that was kind of a break in techno babble. Now, when we go up to what started this whole thing, the video I saw, Voyager, they went back to the next generation idea of using a lot of it. Now, just I'm saying this right, right, just by a personal opinion, this is not carbon stone, it is personal opinion. Um, Voyager did use a lot of techno babble, but I definitely don't think it detracted from it. I mean, they're trapped in the Delta Quadrant. Um, you know, it's kind of important they set up what the ship has. Um, yeah. So, you know, they have these bio neural gel pack things, which are really explained well in the pilot what they do and what they are. Mm -hmm. It isn't like we have this bio neural pack that goes into circuit, Heisenberg, this, that. They're not going into all that. They say what it does for the ship. So, you get a little every man, you get a little techno babble. They kind of balance it to me. Now, how do you do it? I think early on, I'd agree with you, but I think as the series progressed, I mean, I watch a lot of Star Trek, I watch a lot of Voyager, and there is an excessive amount of techno babble in Voyager compared to the other. I think it was a writing thing, maybe, that they just, the writing was kind of, uh, they were, they were kind of just not knowing what to put in there. Yeah, a lot of the, a lot of the writing I found. Like people don't really talk like that a lot of the time, <laughs> you know. It's it's the most unrealistic, I guess, of the tracks as far as writing goes, in my opinion. Anyway, um, it's not bad by any means. I think, but I think when when they uh, started to conjure with the, well, you know, start to mingle more with the board, that's when the techno babble really picked up a lot on Voyager. Point. That. Oh yeah, when Seven and Nine showed up too. You know, she she had diatribes of just techno babble. Right, because, you know, she was like, if you look at Next Generation, you definitely had Data and Jordy being the techno babble people. Yeah. And oftentimes they had to say, even Jordy's like, Data, you know, I use techno babble, you're going way over my line. You know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But with Seven of Nine, you get a crew who use techno babble, I think, rather, um, you know, for emphasis, like you were saying early on. And then when Seven of Nine came on, they even had to say, can you say it in English, basically? Yeah, exactly. because you know she would she would use all these words that they probably didn't even know, like all these Borg phrases she assimilated from who knows where, and you know, and, and just it, it, it she had to kind of give some resonance to it. I think in a lot of ways. Yeah. Now, you know, I haven't really given Enterprise. I've watched most of the series twice through, but you know, Stuart, Jeff, I'm sure you've gone through this. I'm at a point with Next Generation where I can do something that irritates a lot of people and repeat lines. We're talking about 20 episodes a shot with Next Generation or DS9. I've seen those run over and over and over. Voyager's getting the same way. But with Enterprise, I haven't really given it that big a run through. But from what I can see on that, that was kind of more building the techno battle, like constructing it. It, it, it was kind of like, but it wasn't really about that so much. It was about just going out there, but they didn't have a lot of the tech yet, you know? So like, um, it's not really techno babble, but um, it took me a while to figure out what a Manshara class planet was. Ah, the class M planet. And then it's like, oh, they, they, they abbreviated it later because it was a Vulcan term. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's really more a geological classification, isn't it, here? You know, it's not, it's still kind of a techno babble -ish thing, except it's a Vulcan word. So they, yeah, yeah. And Manshara, oh, that's that. That's what it is. Because if we go to Manshara class planets, they're Earth-like. See, with Enterprise, they had to they had they tried to had to go back to the root of the techno babble that was exactly long, that's what it was. All what was before it became what we know, like phasers was you know was phase phase pistols, pistols, yeah. You know, so they did a lot of that during the show, which I thought was was nice that they kind of uh, showed that you know it just didn't spring out of nothing. It was you know mm -hmm. derived from something you know. So, well, you know, if only and okay, um, I'm using a joke three times here. If only they'd been able to explain. What a, detec a detector circuit was. <laughs> I mean, because <I, laughs> that's a bit of the next generation. When we're talking about techno babble here, yeah. I mean, I, that, I don't even know what that was. That I, I, when, when Jeff pointed that out to me, I still can't explain where that fit. That was just like a little. <laughs> Which episode was that in? Who said that? It was. Um, it was a random character. It was. It was an encounter at Farpoint Stewart. Um, it, they, they were just. They were detecting that Q force field. Uh -huh. And he said, there's something new on the detector circuit. Oh, my God. Yeah. 
I think that's probably just a callback to the to the sixties. Right. <laughs> it's a sensor. I figure Gene Roddenberry must have wrote that part of the the dialogue there because that was directly from his yeah. point of view of, of technology at that time. He still brings right. His, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's not his fault. I mean, he just you know he just wasn't very good at the technology of the thing of the Star Trek. But that was I don't even know how you define that as techno babble. Maybe, <laughs> but you know you you, you can well, look at it this way. I mean, I'm sure, you know, in, in our lives, you know, you have auto mechanics, you know, they, they may know how things work, but sometimes they may say, that's a doohickey over there or something, or some colloquial word. We can fit it into the universe maybe by saying that this young, I think it was an ensign or something, a really lower on the lower deck kind of um, enlisted officer on the ship. He wasn't a major character. And he wasn't Riker or Data or anything who said that. Maybe he was just kind of figuring out what a lateral sensor was, what a forward sensor was, and then just came up with this colloquial term they had among uh, cadets, the detector circuit. Then we could link it in like that, like he's using a colloquial weird mm -hmm. term they I don't know. Yeah, I don't think idea. there's a detector circuit, you know? Yeah. In the universe, it, it, to make it sense in the universe what that was. Yeah. Like, we're, we're supposed to ignore it. <laughs> yeah, and the thing with circuit too, I mean, back in the 60s, that would sound advanced, because nobody had computers, nobody had home computers. Right, well, because the communicators had literal circuits. That circuits. Was yeah, exactly. So using that term is not a lot. Not everybody had heard it back then, right? It made sense in the sixties to a degree, yeah. Yeah. But when you get to nineteen eighty-seven and they're detecting something in a sensor, it just sounds like where did that come from? <laughs> but like I said, it could be their equivalent of um, doohickey or monkey wrench or just some term we would use today. Yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. Or like somebody saying, "Oh, that car is a real ad soul or a real melon." You no, know. Yeah. Some little colloquialism, like, yeah. oh well, uh, I know it's sensor, but I just call it a detector circuit, you know. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, jump back to the the uh, screen. Uh, Means yeah. Star Trek the motion picture. Uh, Stuart, did you ever play um, the uh, the role playing game, Star Trek role playing game, back in the eighties or any, any of those? Uh, the Fasa one. The Fasa yeah. one. Yeah. No, I didn't play the role playing element of it, and I didn't actually play this the this, the simulator. I had the miniatures. But I played Starfleet Battles instead, which is kind of like the competition. Yeah, but, you know, yeah. it's weird. I have that role-playing game. I just never played it. I think I still have it. You know, well, the reason why I bring that up is that uh, I think when you play that game, uh, when when you're trying to defend your ship, there's, there's shields, but then they also have what they call sensor uh, deflection or something like that, where it causes your opponent to lose their targeting ability of your ship. And to me, that would seem like some sort of screen, you know, from your ship. That might make sense. You know, and I would think, you know, you know, of course, I've been in the Air Force, so I, you know, they always have, like, things that you can use uh, from from the pilot's point of view, you know, when he's flying, that to make targeting more difficult for your opponent. And and it, so it wouldn't be a shield, per se, but it's, like, more of a, a sensor kind of screen to, you know, make it more confusing for whoever's shooting at you to, to actually hit you. Oh, so, like, ECM, Electronic Countermeasures. Yeah. Electronic counter countermeasures, yeah. 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 So okay, this could be a whole different system. Well that that does make some sense. So maybe the role playing game explains something that Star Trek just didn't in universe. I don't know. Well maybe that's what they meant by screens, you know, because when they they use it in the motion picture, they use both screens and shields. So you have your deflector shields for physically protect the ship and the screens to try to block your opponent from actually hitting you with whatever they're firing at you. It could be. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Like I said, that that could be a way to explain it you know, in universe again. Now, you know, out, you know with, with, with Casa, though, just like the animated series, there's a messiness where that fits into canon. I don't know if it is or isn't. It's just a thing that was there. Yeah. The animated series was the fourth and fifth year of the end of the uh, five-year right. mission. That's how I look at it. But the role-playing game by Fasa, kind of loose, would you say, canon-wise? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Oh, that was my, those things were my Bible back in the day. I mean, that was yeah. my canon. And, yeah, but and like I said, we, it. there wasn't really this heavy thing about canon. I don't know about them, but it, it, if it works, it works. You know, we just use it in universe. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, now, so we've discussed basically the Star Trek series and how each of them views, and even we managed to put role-playing games into that, which is good. Um, now, it, were either of you are familiar, because I didn't see them, were there any, See, I haven't played Star Trek Online or anything like that. I don't know how they apply Technobabble, if they do, or if they're just a simulator. I don't know. I haven't really gotten into it. 
they do they do apply techno babble, but it's basically on on par with TNG. Right. So it's just TNG rehash, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So there's no nothing new they really add to the pot. Yeah. Not really. Now, with have there ever been any recent like role playing games that did the scope what FASA did that added anything to this universe? Uh, not that I can think of offhand. Um, I think when they gave phasers a designation like type six phasers or something like that, that seemed to be a connection to some of the, you know, some of the role playing games that I played, you know, in the eighties with Star Trek, when they started classifying different, different weapons groups. I think I forgot the next gen movies. You mentioned phasers. I thought of the first contact having phasers. The next gen movies have their own different thing. Do you think they just kind of went with, um, uh, TNG techno babble at the end of the day for the most part. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So they were just, you know, um, for, uh, generations through Nemesis, they just, okay. Cause that, you know, like I said, you know, and, uh, of course, you know, um, there's also a techno, techno babble, um, applied to the JJ prize. That's somebody else's story. Anyway, <laughs> we're prime here. So <laughs> anyway, um, like I said, uh, so to kind of put this all together, okay, um, we have, you know, the primary Star Trek series TOS through Voyager, you know, Enterprise, I should say, if you were running on your account. Them. Mm -hmm. uh, which techno babble moments in all of these series do both of you think add the most to Star Trek lore and what happens on the show and how it develops? Wow. Um, um, <laughs> anything having to do with the ant, the, the warp core, the matter antimatter, the deuterium tanks used to use deuterium as fuel. Um, anything like that, I think, was really a big, a big part of Star Trek. I mean, that's they, they talk about the warp systems all the time. Um, so I think that's probably the biggest thing. I don't know when it was first really talked about, to be honest, um, but. Yeah, I would say anything having to do with the warp system would be what I would say. I know that that probably sounds like one of those burling off Rasmussen questions. What do you think was the last innovation in the last 200 years? Because, you know, Riker did say it was the warp coil. Yeah, yeah. You know, and like I said, I suppose that could lead into a subject about warp drive, which is a very big subject for a podcast, but I'm sure people have done it. But um, he said before the warp coil, or well, warp drive in general, people were confined to one sector of space. So, you know, yeah. all right. So it looks like um, I'm getting this notice here that says we have to shut down in 10 minutes for this program. For some reason, having three people on makes it a little different. So, which actually works out pretty well because we were planning on doing a shorter thing. Cool. But uh, is there anything that the three of you could think about that might um, apply to techno babble and Star Trek that really made it interesting for you? I just know to fix anything, you just reverse the polarity of something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can apply that to Doctor Who, I suppose, too, because they, they were into that for a little while. Polarity. Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah. Reverse the polarity of the neutron flow in that case. But anyway, <laughs> the third, and, well, that was the third. But anyway. The one thing, I wish, they, I, the one thing I wish they would have done in the later series that came out was come up with some better tools for the engineers to work with. <laughs> Something yeah, a little more realistic, you know. I mean, yeah, that, that, that's kind of cool to see something glowing with lights on it and everything like that. But let's see yeah. something, you know, something like that. We actually, you know, you're un, you know, unbolting something together. Or, you know, when, yeah. when I was so, younger, I used to I'd watch Star Trek and see what Jordy used for the ships, and I used yeah. to take Lego blocks and put together some of those engineering tools. And you know, they didn't look far off where the props were. Yeah, but you guys, like they were using Legoy things to fix stuff, like little light up Legoy things. Yeah, you know, I, mean, I, I, I would still think there'd be a little bit of more hands-on when it comes to engineering. Right, they, they should have had, like, a little Star Trek tool kit that they actually had very specific, like, Crusher had specific things she used. There's the hyperspanner. You hear about it all the time. You know, right, the hyperspanner, there's a good one they should see more of. It's funny, I was watching Voyager the other day, and the doctor was healing um, Chakotay's cut. It was the, bo the one with Chakotay, Chakotay being a boxer, healing the cut on his uh, eye. And he was yeah. using, it was a vegetable peeler <laughs> with a light. And he's going yeah. back and forth. With, with They put like a clear thing in where the blade was. 
Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like your old image G kind of where they would just find random things and put a beret, beret over Jordy's face or whatever. They just find some random thing. You know, a lot of kitchen tools, all you have to do is paint them up and put stuff on them in their Star Trek tools the way they were doing it. So, Well, you know, the the uh, they used on Chekhov in Star Trek Four, the little brain thing to fix his hemorrhage. Oh, uh, it's good. got a piece of a Clean 97 model kit on the... On the Oh, oh yeah, you know, I was, right. I was wondering if that little thing looked familiar. That was a D7. Yep. Yeah, that was the back end well, of a D7. You know, maybe that actually makes sense because they were on a Klingon bird of prey. Maybe that was some leftover Klingon medical device. <laughs> I don't maybe, maybe they want their medical device to have D7 things on them, you know. See, people, people like us that build these models, we're going to spot that in a heartbeat, you know. Right, just get back to it, <laughs> you know. We're going to find out where they put these things, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and of course, you know, um, I don't know if either of you remember, a sh you probably do remember a show called Reading Rainbow, the Bar Burton was on it. Oh, yeah. They actually went to the set and um, Rob Legato, when he was G, was showing him how they made a little ship to go back to the Enterprise D that had um, little razor blades on it for nacelles. Hmm. Yeah. I, I can't tell you how many razor blade starships I made over the years. I think they're broken now, but I had a bunch of razor blade starships. Well, in Star Wars, uh, the, uh, what was it, the Phantom Menace, they were using uh, women's Razor uh, for their legs, you know that they, they took the, the razor part off and they oh, used, yeah. they handled it out and made a, a little communicator out of it. <laughs> right, yeah, because you know again, kit bashing, yeah. And then there's a, this is a whole other episode about you know, the kit bashing, yeah. um, but the the TNG episode with the the computer thing, um, where they it was trying to sell them the computer program that the defense program. Oh, the Arsenal of Freedom. That's the one. They the part of that robot was actually. A nylon container for yes, the Eagle Papa. <laughs> I knew yeah. that's what it was. I mean, because I, I used to make all kinds of stuff out of those things, and my mother would buy those to come home, and I'd say, "Give me the egg," and I <laughs> and I'd build stuff out of those. Yes, things. that was like um, that was like wasn't that like a, that little thing that attacked him? Wasn't that like some sort of water gun or something? Oh, some, some some glass or something. It was that little egg thing. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm <laughs> I, I think I saw some kid with it in the book, and it was actually it looked like it was like some kind of glass, like some some summer glass you drink with, and they painted up gold or something. Oh. <laughs> so I mean, like I said, they were kid bashing even in the early TNG. But Stewart, you're right. That's another subject, and uh, we're almost running out of time. But uh, um, I want to do this again with all three of you, wanna, uh, and bring in Samuel. That would be a great idea. And I really, really try not to get your names. The S names, I get them mixed up. It's just one of those things. So <laughs> I'll remember because, you know, I have an S for a middle name too. Anyway, but the thing is, is that, um, so yeah, I do want to get back together with you. Maybe we could do a thing on kit bashing. That's kind of part of the fandom, but it is part of Star Trek and it's part of the Star Trek universe. That may be a great subject for us all to do together. Yeah, but Stuart, um, I want to thank you for participating. Yeah. Um, in this, I'm going to do a little plug for both of us here. Um, I'm going to leave a little link down in the description. Uh, please subscribe to uh, Trek Yards and also subscribe to Trek Prime. We're going to be working together. Anyway, <laughs> once in a while. So, you know, um, uh, thank you again, Stuart, for being here. Thank you, Jeff, as always, for being here. And I, I, I think we had a great discussion. And I agree, Techno Babble is really a great thing for Star Trek. And, and I mean, they may overuse it in some cases in Voyager, but it really does enhance the universe. But like anything, you can overuse it. So I'm glad they had it there because it gave Star Trek a universe. And whatever they do with it in the future, you know, it's, it's a messy place right now. Um, I'm hoping they don't <laughs> dumb everything down. I'm hoping they kind of keep some of that Trek talk or that Trek, Treknologic, whatever you want to call it, babble in there. Because it, it, the, the phase inducers, the Heisenberg compensators, anything you want to read about, that's what the Star Trek technology is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you know, people understand, they, it's a, some people use the terms sometimes these days. You know, so it's, it's a good thing that they're there. It, it, it enhances our world. You know, mm -hmm. Star Trek gave us flip phones, iPads, inspiration. So mm -hmm. who knows? We'll have to see. Anyway, thank you all for being here, and uh, we'll see you next time, Jeff and I, on uh, Trek Prime. And um, stay tuned for Trek Yards as well, and there'll be future collaborations. Thank you.